Webster Dictionary entry says, A chorale is a hymn or psalm sung to a traditional or composed melody in church. Seriously, is this all? The chorale is so much more. It is an educator. It serves as an important link between music and theology. And it aided the narrowing of a social gap in society throughout history. So what is its secret? Let's explore. More than 500 years ago, the German monk Martin Luther gifted us an underlying idea for some of our greatest music. But Luther was not just a simple monk. He was a musician, a composer and a linguist. By translating and setting psalms often to his own melodies or to commonly known folk tunes, or even by rewriting Bible texts into his own words and setting those to music, he introduced a form of community singing into the newly reformed Protestant liturgy. These so-called chorales had simple melodies which could easily be memorized and were sung in unison, which means all people shared the same vocal line. Ein Burg ist unser Gott, ein guter und Waffen. Er hilft uns frei aus aller Not, die uns jetzt hat betroffen. Der altböse Feind, mit Ernst er sie jetzt meint, groß macht und viel ist sein grausam Rüstung ist. Auf Erd ist nicht seinsgleichen. This is the chorale we probably most associate with Martin Luther. Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott. He wrote it around 1529 and it has widely been referred to as the Marseillaise of the Reformation. Martin Luther contributed to the earliest collection of chorales, the Geistliche Gesangbüchlein, edited by Johann Walter. Most of the chorales in this collection were composed by Martin Luther and then harmonized in three to five parts by Johann Walter. In those early days of the chorale, the melody was, as we heard earlier, in the tenor part. Luther's intention is clear. By exchanging these difficult compositions sung by professional singers in the old Catholic Church for these simple hymns accessible to everyone, he transforms the music literacy of everyone from the lowest to the highest social class. Luther also asked that singing be taught at school. Everyone should be able to access the Protestant liturgy and take a part in it. Over the coming centuries, we can clearly follow the journey of the chorale. Many German composers took on the idea of the chorale, included them in their compositions, adding their own harmonizations. A prominent group of North German composers, including Dietrich Buxtehude, Franz Tunder and Nikolaus Bruns, championed the chorale throughout the 17th century and helped to keep Luther's tunes alive. By the time Johann Sebastian Bach harmonized chorales in his own sacred works, the main tune had moved into the treble line. He wrote around 400 chorales, which most commonly appear in his cantatas, passions and oratorios. They do, however, also appear elsewhere, for example, in the notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach. Many of Bach's cantatas end with a chorale. 
Looking briefly at the story of a cantata, we are more often than not presented with some kind of dilemma of faith, hardship, illness, or even death. The cantata with its aries and recitatives takes us on a kind of journey, working our way through the problem posed. And then comes the chorale. This short, masterfully harmonized melody lends us some kind of closure which reconciliates us with the burdens we've been dealing with. And we come out of the concluding chorale feeling reassured and safe. I have to ask again, what is its secret? Luther chose the melodies for their familiarity. We all know how hearing a familiar nursery rhyme, a folk song or a hymn can touch us to the core. And that is because we know them so well. And Bach seems to be doing exactly this. He takes a simple Lutheran chorale melody, harmonizes it, and gives the listener of the 18th century and all of us in the 300 years to come an experience of familiarity and comfort. A feeling of things might be tough right now, but they'll be okay in the end. Yeah.